Welcome to the Digital Tourism Show. And in this video, we have the pleasure of speaking with Alex Bainbridge, the former founder and creator of Tour CMS. Now, Alex's influence in the industry should not be underestimated. He was one of the first ones to create an online booking platform that many of us now take for granted these days. He was also one of the first to integrate them with many other systems, including Expedia, Get Your Guide, and Viator. In this video, we will be discussing his new venture, Autura, which is all about autonomous vehicles and how that is going to dramatically change the sightseeing industry. The insights in this video, if you are a Tourer Activities Operator, should not be missed. Welcome, Alex. How are we? Thank you. Good. Thanks for coming up. I definitely came on the train, though, rather yeah. than by plane. Not not not, not a driverless car. Just, not <laughs> fly, well, I don't know. It just seemed it seemed like a it seemed like an easier thing to do. I think yeah, yeah. airports are overrated for uh, the travel industry. I think yeah. you can spend you can sink a lot of time in wasting time getting on and off. Oh, Any time I go to London, I try to get the train as, as much as I can. So, but we're here to talk about autonomous vehicles. Yes. Um, and there's lots of noise about driverless cars and obviously a lot of the manufacturers mm. are starting to create their own versions of these but I suppose my, my question would be is you know, if you look at how long it took people to move away from video to blu-ray for example a lot of people still haven't surely we're still a long long way from this becoming more mainstream yeah I mean if you look at the press I mean if you if you read uh, the press if you watch uh, mainstream technology uh, media you will see a lot of mentions about autonomous cars, self-driving cars, or connected autonomous cars. They all have slightly different meanings, but they all roughly mean the same thing. Um, <clears throat> and you're kind of you're kind of thinking, okay, well that's kind of fun, but that seems like a long way away. Is this really going to be something that's going to be here anytime soon? And if it does arrive, what does it mean to me, someone who runs a uh, small or medium-sized travel business. So it is quite easy from that perspective mm -hmm. to sort of push it <laughs> off and go, hang on a minute, you know, this is, this is not going to be for a while. But then you um, start looking at the plans that the large car companies have got, and the majority of them are focused around the couple of key dates. Um, the first is 2025, and the second is 2030. And again, these sound like quite a long way in the future, but I'm, I'm going to explain why it's not now. Um, and the, and by 2030, people like Cruise, people like General Motors, people like Ford, people like Volvo, Volkswagen, assume that there will be no per personal ownership of cars. Now, that's a pretty impressive statement, but that means in 11 years' time, people won't own cars. Right? And they will, people will therefore use shared cars that will be potentially owned by the car companies themselves. So if you start working back from that date, you think, OK, well, that means that the technology will be fully fine and massively rolled out in 2030. You get to a point where the car companies are at now, which is where they're beginning to think, well, hang on, we've got to shift from being a car manufacturer business to being a service business. So companies like Ford are saying, oh, we're going to have to shift all of our dealerships, because if you don't have personal ownership of cars, you don't need dealers. Um, we're going to have to shift all the dealers into uh, autonomous garages, etc. Um, and so these, those car companies have started their transition already. So they are, uh, they are all launching taxi services. They're all launching vehicle experience businesses. And the majority, autonomously, meaning no drivers, and the majority of them have got timelines of 2020, 2021. So General Motors, which is a pretty large company, is going live in 2020. Ford is going live in 2021 with large-scale rollouts of vehicles. So that means that in the next two, three, four years, you in cities, rural, we'll come on to rural in a second, but cities are going to see a massive influx of cars delivering experiences in cities that have come from completely outside the sightseeing industry. And so what I've been thinking about is, okay, that's kind of interesting, scary technology. And I'm a, I'm a technologist. I've spent 20 years in sightseeing technology, as Chris explained. But I'm also uh, a bit like Ian. I've got a computer science degree. So I'm a, I'm a technologist at heart. 
And I kind of got attracted to travel technology the same way that Ian did, which is, well, if you like technology and you like um, travel, then you should work in travel technology in some way. Um, so if you, if you sort of see all these, these the, this compression of oversupply of just vehicles that are going to appear in the, next, um, in the next three or four years, if you today are running bus tours or you're running taxi tours or you're running um, even bike tours or, or scooter tours, because bikes and scooters is another whole area we can come on to, that this is going to be something you really have to start thinking about over the next couple of years. Um, and that, that's kind of where I've been coming from, is just working out what those impacts are. And then we, then we have to move away slightly from those big vehicle manufacturers who are probably quite large companies and therefore may be slow to change. But then you look at companies like Google or you look at somebody like um, Apple. So Google announced last week that they're building a factory with 400 workers in to uh, to f for because the, they've just put a, an order in for 75,000 autonomous cars. Oh, that's a pretty scary number. And then you've got Apple, who have got a thousand people working in their autonomous car unit. So we'll have an. Auto so if, if if you if you know the number of people who like their Apple iPhones and they they like their iPads, who's got who's got an iPhone? Okay. Do you all love your iPhone much more than Android? Yeah. Okay. Well, people are probably going to love. No one's actually seen one yet, but people are going to love an Apple autonomous car if there is an Apple. Hopefully, the charge car. lasts longer than a. Well, phone. who knows? <laughs> um, so, I mean, we don't even know if, they're, if it's going to be a car. It may just end up being a delivery robot. So, you know, it could be all sorts of things. But let's just assume, just for a second, that this might not be something that happens in 24 months, but it could be something that happens in 48 months. Um, Apple's all about the experience, and sightseeing is all about the experience. So, if 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 a customer comes to to your city and uh, they have an opportunity to get on a sightseeing bus or they've got an opportunity to get in an Apple autonomous car and do a similar tour, you have to really wonder which one they're going to choose. Yeah, I suppose, I, I suppose in a way that's, that's one of the things in the industry at the moment. Everyone is looking at the big players like the car manufacturers and I thought about mm. Apple, as you mentioned there, Amazon will no doubt look at this side of things as well. So it's, yeah. it's, it's people who you don't re realise is going to come out with these type of products. Well, the, the problem fundamentally mm -hmm. is also the one about value add. I mean, mm -hmm. We can get onto the economics. Mm -hmm. The economics is, is, is pretty boring, mm -hmm. but it's much more interesting talking about customer experience because customer <coughs> experience is what really drives this. Can we deliver a better customer experience than what you can deliver in a minibus? Mm -hmm. Is the answer yes or no? I don't know. That, that's what we're looking to find out. But, um, but, but the economics of it are interesting because if you look at a, a taxi today, it's two or three pounds a mile. And if you look at an autonomous car, they're expected to be 30 or 40 pence per mile. So 10% of the cost. Now, um, so the prices for taxis are going to go through the floor. So the that's the reason why like, mm. people like Uber and Amazon and everyone else want to look into autonomous cars, is because they want to get into food delivery. They want to get into sh uh, grocery delivery, because that's where the money is. That's where the, real, that's where the money is, because you can get more money from delivering someone's supermarket shopping than you can from actually moving a human from one place to another if the prices go through the floor. And then you look at um, sightseeing prices. Well, most customers will pay 30 to 50 pounds an hour So, if, for an experience. That's a massively high amount of money in comparison to the actual ground cost of the vehicle itself, because you're spending most of that on the fact that you've got to have a very expensive driver because they not only have to be a great driver because they're carrying a uh, tourist, but they also have to be able to be a great tour guide as well. That's a very hard job um, and to do well. And I think that, um, you know, so, the, so, so of course these companies who are all of these sort of vehicle companies who are going, oh, actually, hang on a minute. We should think about, um, let's look at sightseeing because there's more money to be made. Um, you know, if, if you as a customer, if you if you as a taxi driver, uh, or as, a, or as an autonomous car company, dropped off two or three customers at uh, at an aquarium, and you were on ten or fifteen percent commission from the tickets that those customers bought, that money is far exceeds any income that you would make from the actual physical delivery of those people as a taxi. Mm -hmm. So, so what I'm really saying, and that's the reason I sort of I'm sort of on this sort of mission to. to talk to people about it really, is we've got a bit of a problem coming, actually. Um, we've had so many innovations over the last 20 years that have been quite easy to navigate. I mean, the introduction of the web, 
the introduction of mobile, the introduction of social. And the reason why they've been quite easy to navigate as a tour company is because um, they've just affected retail. Mm -hmm. they've, ch they've changed how, you bu how customers buy. So now you're, getting, you're not getting concierge bookings, you're not getting visitor centric bookings, but you are getting sort of bookings by email or booking straight into your res system. Um, but this is a product change. And we haven't had a product change for 100 years. Uh, the last time we had a product change in sightseeing was 1910 with the introduction of the um, tour bus. Um, so we, we're just not used in sightseeing mm -hmm. to product innovation. And ultimately, that's where the problem is going yeah. to be. And so I just, have, I'm, 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 my natural inclination is to, is to try and fix that, try and address that, and help existing sightseeing companies transition. But of course, you then need to kind of understand that, well, first of all, you've got to kind of look at it and think, well, actually, is this like a problem? Am I going to have to deal with this? Or am I not going to do this? Or can I deal with this later? You know, should we just wait for autonomous cars to come out and then react? You know, or do we need to think about this now? But, uh, and the reason why I kind of suggest to people that they start thinking about now is that especially the, the bigger sightseeing companies have got a slightly larger challenge in that they buy their buses and they, they expect 10 years use out of their bus, mm -hmm. 15 years use, 10 years use. And if autonomous vehicles are part of, not completely the whole, but part of the sightseeing product mix in five years' time, then what are you going to do with all of these amazingly large sightseeing buses? I don't know. You know, we're going to have a bit of an issue because we yeah. have an oversupply. That was actually one of my questions was, uh, what are these businesses going to do when they start ordering up buses now? Because as you say, they're not going to be worth much in 15 years' time. Of when well, they'll be, they'll, I mean, they I retrofit think, them, for example? I think these, these buses, well, see, retrofitting is not quite the point because they're mm -hmm. the wrong size. Mm -hmm. um, see, I, my view, and I've not modelled this completely yet, but is that, is that my view, though, is that the, <coughs> a single bus, if you, look at, if you look at the history, the reason why we have big buses today it's because we have a driver. And as soon as you have a driver, you need a driver, because today you have to have drivers, right? Because you don't have autonomous. So you need a driver in your bus. Take that for granted. So as a result of having a driver, you have to have a big bus. Because if you have a big bus, you uh, divide that cost of that driver more evenly amongst you know, 30, 40 passengers than, let's say, a taxi, where you've got three or four passengers. Mm -hmm. um, so you, of course, it's most, it's most efficient to have a bus. So you're going to have a big bus. Yeah. But the problem then, once you've got a big bus, is you have to fill it with customers. So you end up with popular tours. You end up doing these you know, highlights of this city kind of type tours, which are right at the head of the market. You know, like the Hollywood blockbuster kind of a tour. That is very, very popular, but they're the only things that you can put in a bus because you need to sell, 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 constantly, constantly to keep that bus full. Whereas if you replace those buses with shuttles, and a shuttle has got a capacity of, let's say, six to eight people, family size, so just single family goes in a single, sh uh, single shuttle, um, you'll need three or four shuttles to replace the capacity of a single bus. Mm -hmm. um, but you, so that's why I don't think you can retrofit. Yeah. Uh, you can do more niche products, I suppose, with a smaller You, thing, do, yeah. you completely yeah. change, the, yeah. change the product. So no longer are we doing Hollywood films, mm -hmm. but we're now doing sort of Netflix, straight to TV type films, uh, because we can have that selection of all those sort of routes and interesting things that you can do. You can get in your car and go, oh, I've got one of, you know, I can do 50 things from here, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a completely different model. So the, so, so you, the, the challenge is that we're going to end up with all this sort of capital investment mm -hmm. in all these uh, vehicles. Yeah. And they won't, be the, they, they, won't, <laughs> they won't be the product that the customer wants to buy because yeah. the customer will be, will be given an option. Do you want to get in a bus? Do you want to get in an autonomous Apple car? And you'll get any autonomous Apple car. Mm -hmm. It's I, true. I, I know I would. Yeah. I, I, I'd rather be in a smaller group than a smaller mm -hmm. group rather than a big massive. Yeah, it, you know, available on demand. Yeah. So you can, if you oversleep in the morning and you go, I want to start my tour at 11.05, you can start your tour at 11.05. You don't have to get yourself to some visitor centre, you know. So I think it's going to be, so this is like quite a lot of change, I, I think, you know, and I, and I, I, I do appreciate that um, I'm probably going to spend the next 12, 18 months sounding like I'm completely... Uh, <laughs> You know, loony. But I had to do this with my last business. Okay, so I'll tell you a bit. Tell you. Well, I was going to ask what, what, what made this. What made this a viable oh, option? Because you could have went in different, so many different directions. So well, what you, made this? Can I just come back? Come sure, back sure. to that question. I was just, just finish that point. Yeah. My last business, Tor CMS. So we were the technology that underpins, uh, and the only reason I use past tense is because I sold it. Actually, Tor CMS still still is out there. 
Um, it's a technology that underpins quite a lot of the sightseeing industry today. So um, certainly at the bigger end of the market, with the big sightseeing companies. <clears throat> I spent three or four years when I started Tour CMS, pretty much from oh, 2007 to 2012, going around every travel industry con conference, trying to convince large online travel agents that they wanted to connect to our system. And it wasn't because they didn't want to connect to us, they just didn't connect to anyone. So I was trying to convince, I was trying to push this industry. So I spent five years going around trying to get things to happen. And eventually, of course, it did happen. Fine, great. Um, but, uh, you know, so I've, so, so I've been in this position before. So the fact that I'm here again, this is actually a, this is quite a nice position. I quite like this position where I'm sitting there going, okay, we've got this future technology. It's coming in about 18 months' time. We need to get everyone prepared. It's pretty, pretty much the same path that I did with my last business where I, had to, where I moved early on the technology and then had to just spend a long time educating because I want to work with suppliers. I'm not here to compete with suppliers. I'm just trying to say, look, if you've got an existing sightseeing business, I want you to come on board. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, that, I'm not trying to say, well, I'm, you know, this is not like Uber versus taxis. This is, um, you know, this is sort of a bit more collaborative than yeah. that. So. Yeah. Yeah. So you had a question. No, I was just saying, what made this a, a, a viable option for you? Because as I say, you could have went in so many yeah. different directions so with all the things that are happening in the industry. So what, what was it that made it appeal to you about autonomous? Well, I worked on the I'm working on the theory that I had to do another startup. Because um, I, I got a reasonably good exit in my last one, but I was working on the theory that I, I do intend to live rather a lot, lot longer. So therefore, I was working on the theory that I had probably be better do another startup. And therefore, I'd probably better do one now rather than in 20, 30 years' time. Um, so that's the reason I came into it. And I looked at a number of different options. And I thought, OK, well, what, what are the things um, that I could do? You know, what, what, what areas could I get back into? And having just spent the last 15 years working in, in retail distribution, like how travel agents sell sightseeing product on behalf of small tour operators, I didn't really fancy coming and sort of wrecking that by using blockchain, because I was like, oh, that, doesn't, firstly, blockchain conferences are completely mad. And secondly, I just didn't fancy destructing what I just spent 15 years constructing. So that didn't, didn't seem to make okay. any sense. Yeah. So, that was, so, that was, so that went off the table. Uh, the next one was sort of augmented reality, virtual reality. I thought, oh, I could go into a business doing that because I still think there's this sort of opportunity uh, you know, to, there. But, but ultimately, what, I, what it came down to was that I love technology, I love travel, I like sightseeing, I like things that people do in destination. And we'd spent all this time on technology just on the retail side, like how you buy the product. And I thought, well, how can we get technology to actually enhance the, the experience itself? And, and I thought, so I looked at that, I thought, well, the next thing that's going to change is uh, autonomous vehicles. Um, so, I, so that's the reason I went for that, was mainly because I want to use technology to actually make better experiences not just be a technologist, I just want to say, look, this customer, they've got three hours in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the best thing that we can do that matches their requirements, that meets, you know, that overwhelms them with an experience that they'll remember for the rest of their lives? You know, that's what we, that's what we want to do. Yeah. And as technologists, we've not done that. All the technologists in the sightseeing business have been too busy working on retail and distribution, i.e. how travel agents sell the product. And that's mainly an accounting problem and a data problem. And I much prefer the experience problem. So sightseeing is an experience problem. So talking about um, the experience, uh, we, sort of t we touched on it a little bit earlier on, but obviously there's going to be fundamental changes to the, the vehicles and the, and the products. That they, the actual experiences and the content that these companies deliver, that will have to change dramatically as well. So how do you see that sort of playing out? Yeah, the, I mean, the, the experiences will, um, I think, I mean, you know, they're going to be, they can be very different. So today's classic sightseeing is, as I said, at the head of the market. It's all very um, sort of popular stuff. We're going to end up with very long tail. So you could come here. Um, so, so I'll give you a number. So at, today, if you work in a very large sightseeing company, if you have a tour on your listing, you may only have 20 or 30 tours that you operate on a regular basis. If any one of those tours does less than, perhaps it's fewer than, that's that expensive education down there. Um, <laughs> if you do fewer than uh, 500, is it fewer than or less than? Oh, you're talking to an old person. Oh, so. okay, okay. <laughs> well, okay. You, got, you got me on video, I'm in big trouble now. Um, if you do fewer than 500 bookings a year, you would, um, 
uh, you would just delist that tour because it's like, oh, the vi it's just not a viable tour to train all your tour guides to get them to do that tour. It's not viable to spend all that time listing them on the travel websites, etc. Um, so we end up with these very popular tours, and we're going to now end up with tours that you know you might have the um, very niche topic, some particular historical event that happened in 1970 that only 50 people a year have got any interest in learning about, but because it's digitally delivered rather than tour guide delivered. Um, we'll come back to tour guides. They will, they're, they're not going to lose their jobs. Well, you can, they're just the vehicles can literally be programmed um, for so, any type of tour. So you're going to end up with, so, you, so, you, so as I said, you're just going to end up with just completely different experiences. Mm -hmm. So you could then also design sort of a shopping experience that, you know, at the moment, the, sort of the high-end um, hotels want to do that. So, you know, have a shop, go to a shop, a shop, a shop, then a restaurant. Um, but the other things that we're looking at is kind of the, the more fictional uh, the fictional side mm -hmm. of things. So you don't have to, doesn't have to be kind of based on culture or based on uh, history, which a lot of sightseeing is, but it can be based on uh, just creating sort of storytelling. Yeah. Well, that, you just sort of mentioned it there, and that, that, that's a bit that really excites me is the fact that you could have an autonomous vehicle um, and someone can create their own custom itinerary and that can just basically be programmed into that vehicle and it'll just take them off whatever they've, they've yeah. selected. Yeah, I mean, even just simple things mm -hmm. like um, how you do a handoff from a hotel concierge to a um, to a customer. When a customer goes to a hotel concierge and says, where's the best restaurant around here? And the, the concierge gets out a bit of paper and starts marking a cross on the paper and gives the bit of paper over. You're like, well, that's kind of how you've, everyone's done it mm -hmm. for like 100 years. Uh, firstly, um, what the concierge will now be able to do is be able to just put a cross on a map and ping that to the car. If the customer gets in the car, they will actually know that the car's got to the right restaurant. But secondly, of course, we're not actually going to have concierges. Uh, what we're going to have is um, <laughs> voice assistants in rooms. So you'll have, hey, Alexa, uh, you'll be in your hotel room. You go, hey, Alexa, where should I go for a restaurant? Alexa will say, uh, oh, you could go to these three places. And uh, you'll go, oh, that sounds great. Uh, Alexa, can you get me a car? And the car will turn up. And of course, the location will be pre-programmed in the car. So it changes, you know, it changes all that kind of dynamic. Too. If they can get past the Scottish accent, because any time I've used any of these sort of things, it's like, yeah. I've just seen the two guys in a lift talking in and out. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, well, that's the thing. Scotland have been doing, a, it was actually yourself posted up the article that I initially saw, but Scotland have been doing a lot of um, uh, tests on self-driving uh, self cars, uh, putting it through its paces, you know, putting it up against animals and things, on single track roads, etc. So, uh, to me, that seems uh, uh, that part of it seems a long way off. Do you think this will be more confined to cities, especially in the meantime, or do you think it'll be it'll end up being more rural eventually, or do you think do you think that's still way way off? Well, actually, I think driving in the rural is actually going to be easier because the act driving sticking to a road is not the hard mm. bit. The hard bit is interacting with traffic, interacting with things. So there's, there's, the cities is slightly more troublesome. Um, I mean, but I'm not a vehicle engineer. I'm a yeah. I'm an I'm an experienced person, so mm -hmm. I'm not really the right person to answer that. But I, for me, as an, an, as an entrepreneur, putting my entrepreneur hat on, I prefer the urban problem because it's a higher volume problem. And uh, if you're going to make a, a lot of effort to build a new platform, you have to chase the volume before you can chase anything else. Um, so I'm, I'm absolutely sure there will be rural usage. But, um, and in fact, the, what I've been working on supports rural and supports road trips, which is when you go on multiple day trips. Um, but... Um, as an entrepreneur, you have to chase volume. Yeah. I'm just thinking that if you're on a, it happened to me quite a few times down in Cornwall, if you're on a really, really tight single track road, if you're on an autonomous vehicle and you get someone who's not an autonomous vehicle, they're probably going to win because yeah. <laughs> that's the human element. Sort of yeah, thing. so that's, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. So the, the two bits of law that needs to change yeah. in the UK to make this all legally happen, the first is the insurance issue, and that went through uh, the Houses of Parliament mm -hmm. last year. So that is now law, so that's addressed. Uh, well, sufficiently addressed. Um, and the second is the changes to the highway code. And that includes things like uh, you must always be paying attention. So they've got to rewrite pretty much a lot of the highway code because uh, mm -hmm. there were lots of statements in there that just not compatible with autonomous vehicles. And that's something that, that hopefully will go for the House of Parliament in 2019. But I hear the politicians might be busy on something else. I don't know. <laughs> 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 if, we have enough people, if we have enough people left in this country yeah. to actually build the cars, might be a, Well, a, I mean, a, a, the problem is, is in 2019, we got to, uh, there's an autonomous taxi service launching in London this year. In fact, launched just before Christmas. So, so the law hasn't quite caught up with everything yet. Mm. So. 
So your business called Autura? Yeah, which is auto, tor, auto yeah. meaning self in yeah. Greek, and auto meaning uh, around here yeah. in French. Okay, and like autor auto also means author in Portuguese. So it's just like all these right words. So <laughs> it's better than that last one you mentioned earlier. Um, so, so what's that going to bring to the industry then? So obviously you're not going to be a manufacturing car, so what's, what's that? Element? No, so I'm doing two things. So I've, I've built now mm -hmm. the platform that delivers the experiences. Um, so we're now onboarding sightseeing companies, existing sightseeing companies and other local entrepreneurs who have got existing experiences. Um, so for example, an autonomous car will create a sequence of things to do. So you might go to the restaurant, you might go and play golf, and then you might go to the theatre, where you need to book the golf, you need to book the theatre. So the, stick, the, the autonomous cars don't just change everything overnight. They, you need to, um, I'm not going to use that word, the word that I like. Um, there's a, the, the, um, <coughs> you need these products that you can't break down any further. So you need, to, so for example, a whitewater raft, you can't, you, you, a whitewater raft is a whitewater raft, if that's what it is for three hours, what it is. But a walking tour that goes to four or five cafes and goes to a place, actually that is, that's the kind of thing that will be broken down into smaller individual units or sort of experience units. Um, I still not trying to use that word, but Chris and I are joking about this word that I've made. Okay, I'll say it now, because I, I've got this word, it's horrible. But and Chris is marketing and he's been telling me it's horrible, so I'm not gonna use it, but immutable. So who's heard the word immutable? It's a, it's a word that's used a lot in blockchain conferences because it means you can't change it once it's been committed. Uh, it's the same thing with an experience at all. So if you do a whitewater rafting, you can't break it down any further. Whereas if you do a four hour walking tour around a city, actually someone can say, oh, they're using that cafe, that restaurant, that park. Well, you can break that down and reconstruct it for cars and for bicycles. Um, so it's a sort of a horrible piece of jargon, which I'm really, not pleased that I've now got myself on video saying, because no one understands it to begin with. And then secondly, when you explain it, everyone's like, still don't get it. So, <laughs> so when are you looking to launch? When, uh, when we're launching, well, we're launching sort of now, because, um, um, so the tech's sort of done, um, and we're launching now with um, brands. Brands is what we're all about. Mm -hmm. um, so you're gonna get, you're gonna take a, you're gonna get into your autonomous car, your Apple autonomous car, and you'll you'll get a hotel chain branded experience, for example. Um, so we're we're now working with destination marketing organisations and hotel chains and others to create branded experiences. Excellent. Um, which is what we're doing right now. Yeah. But we're probably doing it from a fairly traditional perspective because we're taking. I've stayed, I'm taking the starting point of innovation as to where the sighting industry is today and then I'm taking it on from here because my vision is to transition existing sightseeing businesses and therefore, so I can't make that, I can't make that leap too large. And also, I'm also hedging slightly because I don't quite know when autonomous cars are gonna be here. So they, you know, if, if they're here in sort of 36 months, great, which that's where I think they'll be here. But if they're here in five, six years, then I need to run a viable business in the meantime. So I'm evolving people, evolving businesses from where they currently are to, um, to the future. I believe you're, you're speaking at ITB, you're one of the main speakers there as well. I, I am, I'm speaking yeah. at ITB. I'm doing a session at um, Travel Technology Show on innovation. Yeah, I'm a little bit of a... You've got a keynote speak, speak, speaking. I am doing the keynote at ITB. I have no idea how that happened. So, I, <laughs> so, what hap so I've just looked it up. So what happened, right? So, so ITB, I've got to tell you the story. You're going to edit this off the film, right? <laughs> My wife will kill me. Um, so the, so the ITB, so I'm doing this, the keynote panel has got four people on it now. It's got a guy, a board member from Amadeus, who's got 15,000 employees. It's got um, the, the co-founder of Kluck, he's got $200 million of funding. They've got the head of tools and activities for Google, and me. I'm like going, oh, hang on, how, how, where did that go? But anyway, that's the Just shows you your influence. I know, I, know. I was like, what's going yeah. on? But anyway, my punishment, I suppose it's not really punishment. Uh, my punishment for doing that is that I have, I've also got to go and do a panel at ITB on Brexit. So that's going, to be, that's going to be great, isn't it? They said, no one British wants to be on this panel. I'm like, <laughs> my wife is German. She's like, oh, she's going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're going to open up to the floor. So if anybody got any questions, raise your hand and Jessica will come around with the mic. Yep, we've got a question up the back there. Is it turned on? The lights are on. Oh. There we go. Just hit the record button. That's it. There we go. Thank you. Hi, uh, Hi. Deborah Macken of East Campus Moon Holiday Cottages. 
I found that fascinating. I get okay. it. I get that it will happen. Um, I'm more cynical about the time frame, but let's just see how that goes. But I'm curious as to whether you feel the pattern of sightseeing will change and perhaps how. I get totally that you can customize a tour for anybody, whatever their interests are. But actually one of the reasons there are hotspots in city areas, in rural areas, the Isle of Skye, et cetera, et cetera. If you're talking, uh, setting up your tour and you go, I want to go to that restaurant, I want to stay uh, on the west side of Loch Lomond, I want to go and see the top sightseeing, is it just a case of the data will be the top five places on TripAdvisor or Instagram or whatever, and therefore you're intensifying those hotspots? I know for some yeah. people, you'll totally customize and it'll be fabulous. But actually, a lot of travel and every other industry is about sheep following sheep. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. I think one of the big issues with uh, discovery, which is what it's called, when you, how you're helping people find stuff, um, is that you end up often pushing popular versus what that individual will find interesting or memorable. Um, so you're, because if you know, if you talk about food and restaurants, it, it, it's very easy to push McDonald's and Burger King because that's what's popular, but that's actually not what someone came for the experience. So you have to, you have to somehow filter out popular, or or you have to somehow come at it from a different perspective. So one of the uh, biggest skills that we're going to need, I think, is, is really the the route design itself. So how do we get some humans who really know the destination to start creating uh, really sort of interesting routes that are kind of uh, are suitable for these vehicles. Quite different to today's sightseeing tour routes, as I said, which are designed to be, designed to be popular. These are going to be designed to be slightly different. Um, but the second thing, which, is, uh, which wasn't in the question, but I could sort of hear it in the background, is, oh, is sort of this, this problem of over-tourism <laughs> and how do we handle over-tourism. And one of the things that we know as a result of autonomous vehicles is we'll know how many people are going to turn up at any one destination at any one time? Because um, we'll be tracking the vehicles. Um, we're not tracking people. We're tracking the vehicles. We'll have to know where our vehicles are. Um, and you will be able to say uh, that there are 30 people turning up at 11.20 and 45 people turning up at 11.45, whatever it is. Um, and so you could then ping to those customers and say, did you know it's going to be really busy here this morning? Um, would you, we can give you in some form of incentive, you can go this afternoon instead, uh, blah, blah, blah. So one of the things that um, the tourist boards are interested in looking at is not, this doesn't help with over-tourism in terms of one city versus another, but it does help with balancing within a single city with the people who are already in there. And so you can start uh, balancing and, um, and sharing um, sharing the, sort of that, that demand across different time zones. Because you could even say to, you know, if you can say to 500 people, don't go to there today, how about going there tomorrow? You can begin to affect um, sort of customer behavior. Now, that requires two things, of course. It requires having a platform, which no one has today, which has access to all of those uh, customers. And, sec and secondly, one of the things that I want to start doing with some sort of uh, tourism students is actually researching consumer behavior and working out, well, what are the triggers that would, uh, that would, what are the incentives, what are the triggers that would actually change consumer behavior? Uh, because my sort of, I do a lot of work with uh, destination marketing organizations uh, and government tourist boards. And um, my vision for them, uh, independent of autonomous cars, but my, in my vision for them is that they're going to move away from being um, organizations that try and get, attract people to a city, but to, to organizations that manage existing uh, people within a destination. So I imagine them sat in a control center, you know, just like you see control centers for any big operation, and they'll be able to uh, pull a lever and a whole tranche of customers will, you know, go to a different location and, or, or, or be incentivized to change their behavior. Um, we're a long way from that, but that's, I would quite, you know, that's the kind of thinking that um, you have to do. I mean, one of the problems with um, innovating. Um, effectively 10 years out, is that you have to start thinking, well, what are the other things that are going to be in play at that time? Mm -hmm. So it's quite, it's quite difficult. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of having to hedge. Well, I think, well, if, we have des if destinations have control centers, what, what levers do we give them? You know? 
Yeah, I've got a question in front. Uh, hi, this is Ian from Travel Massive. And uh, thank you for, for um, the discussion so far. It's very interesting. Um, so the question I have for you, it's kind of two questions, but I'll make it super quick, is can you actually give an example of a, uh, of a tour? What would, can you describe the experience and kind of what will happen? Let's say we're here at Citizen M and I'm staying here. How can you sort of describe to me how this uh, autonomous vehicle tour might work from kind of me coming, checking into the hotel, going on the tour and coming back? And the, the second question backed onto that is, what is the difference between that and I guess me just simply hiring a car, for example, and using Wikipedia or, or Google and doing it myself? Okay, so I'm going to answer the second question first, if that makes sense. So, I mean, one of the, one of the ways that, why isn't this just data, is, is the whole experience, the whole thing. And this is one of the reasons why, for example, um, we have, you know, it's good news and bad news that Google is in tours and activities and sightseeing, promotion and retail. Because they're very good at data. They're very good at telling you what's possible and making that booking happen. But no one ever... Uh, has expected Google or any of these other data companies to start making subjective discussion, subjective um, sort of analysis of what you should do, what you might you might find interesting, and they can't do that because they would require you to give over too much of your profile data for them to give you the right answer. So they're stuck as businesses providing you just plain data. So we need to go to the next level, which is where we get local experts, we get uh, subject matter experts. Someone might be an expert in, um, in, in whiskey tours, and they would then write an itinerary that was designed around that, and we would deliver that and make that. Uh, so so one, of the, one of the things that happens in tours and activities today, you've probably seen, all seen them, is that there's lots of these uh, tour guide marketplaces. Um, Airbnb's got the biggest one, probably. Well, probably the biggest. They definitely have it. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, they have a tour guide marketplace. And the biggest issue with them is that you, as the tour guide, you have to deliver that tour. So if you advertise that you can run a beer tour or a whiskey tour, that's, you have to block out your next sort of 10 Saturdays, because that's just on the off chance that someone might book one. Uh, whereas if you put your property on Airbnb, you don't have to be there when the guest goes and stays. So, we've, so P2P, person-to-person -person marketplaces and tours and activities have never taken off. And the reason they've never taken off is because you have to deliver the product. So now I'm saying is we can do that. We can actually make those marketplaces work because those individuals who used to want to deliver passionate local knowledge to visitors can now just design an experience and the car will execute it at a repeated time. So that I think is so. That's kind of what the why the experience is different to just getting, you know, getting bringing up Wikipedia is that we've got that layer. So we've got in our system at least we've got two layers of branding. We've got the branding like the hotel chain or the DMO branding, and then we've got the designer branding so that you might be taking a, a whiskey tour from this whiskey specialist, and they might have a video introducing themselves and telling you who they are. But you'll also be doing it within a master brand of the local tourist board or a hotel chain or a local luxury hotel or whoever it is who wants to put their brand on it. And then we've got our brand. We're, if you want to compare what we are, we're like YouTube. So people have channels on YouTube where it's their brand, and then you have YouTube as the platform behind it. We're like YouTube. We're like the platform behind it. And then the brands sit on top. Uh, but I didn't talk about the, the experience. Lots of different ways. But the classic one, the one that I've explained for bikes, is I want you to get onto your, uh, to talk about, forget about autonomous cars for a second, because there's a couple of nuances around training how you use an autonomous car. But let's talk about scooters and bikes. I want you to be able to get on your bird bike or your line bike that's just lying there on the street. Uh, you you swipe your card. Well, not you swipe your card on your bike, but you know what I mean. You press the button, say, I'm hiring this bike. And then it says, oh, I can see your location. I know it's 3 p.m. on a Friday. Here's a list of uh, five tours that you could take. Select one, and then it will do the turn-by-turn uh, -turn instructions describing where you should where you should go. So that's the kind of experience that we can deliver on a bike and a scooter today. So that's kind of pre-autonomous cars, but the same rough principle. Cool. I think I saw two people putting their hands up, so we'll go one there on the front. I think there was one in the back earlier on. So. Hi, I'm Ian Smith, and actually I run a small tour business at the moment, Glasgow Tours, doing customised, highly customised tours in Scotland. I found your talk very interesting. Um, I've got a couple of questions one is about pricing. Um, you quoted an example of designing your own tour. You slept in, in 
you know, the cars at the door at 10 past 11 in the morning. Um, is there going to be an aspect of um, Uber surge pricing to cope with supply and demand? That's one part. And the second bit is, if you're talking autonomous vehicles, autonomous cars, why don't you go the full hog and have autonomous individual people movers such as, um, I've forgotten the name, Segways mm. or similar? Yeah, OK, that's a great question. So, so pricing and, and, and supply and demand is a slight challenge. The question for me to answer is about whether or not the, the experience delivery is how, how important the car is, how important the vehicle is to the experience delivery. So, for example, if you've got uh, Uber with a fleet of autonomous cars, you've got Apple with a fleet of autonomous cars, you've got Ford with a fleet of autonomous cars, and they will just be hundreds and they will all be parked around the corner, maybe our data unit, which is the experience, will be just be able to download it from within the, within the user interface of the car or in your mobile app. So from that perspective, there will not be a, a supply side problem if we're going to use these robot taxis as the delivery unit. If, however, we're building vehicles, designing vehicles that are designed especially for sightseeing. So for example, one of the things that people like, I'm not sure about Glasgow, but we, one of the main factors that's always in um, is open top. So I don't know if you all have open top sightseeing buses here. Yeah. Um, do you? I don't know. Yeah, we do. You? Yeah. Okay. Jeez. But they're rather wet. But yes. Brave people. These brave people. Anyway, um, so for example, open. We, you know, we, we might want a specially designed uh, sightseeing vehicle that's designed for delivering experiences. So one of the other things is uh, the seating arrangement. So quite a lot of these seatings are inward facing because so they call it campfire seating where it's all inward facing, whereas when you're sightseeing, you want to look out. So, uh, you know, we have to, so I, I think there will probably need to be a specialist sightseeing vehicles, which might be in less, there might be less supply of. Um, from a pricing perspective, um, I've got some quotes for some current cars, and they're about half the price of a single decker, um, you know, 50 capacity bus. But the problem is you need three or four of them to replace the capacity of an individual uh, single-decker bus. Um, but the prices will come down because half of the cost of an autonomous vehicle is sensors, and that technology is the price that's going through the floor. So that should be OK. Um, but in the main, also, these vehicles, um, if you look at existing sightseeing, if the major majority of the tour prices are set really by the availability of uh, great drivers, because they've got to be able to drive and they've got to be able to give tour guide in a tour guide. So if you, um, so from a cost perspective, if we start removing some of those costs, I think we'll be able to deliver re uh, cheaper, less expensive. I don't know which you I'm, you need, I need you on marketing. What's the difference <laughs> between cheaper and less expensive? Anyway, we're going to have less expensive tours on. Um, than, than what you can do today. So I think you know today. I mean, people as customers, if you are, if you look at a list of uh, tours that you can do as a customer, they're all going to be thirty to forty pounds per hour per person. That's roughly where a tour is priced. And if the, it, you know that with, for an autonomous vehicle, you should be able to deliver that massively. At, you know, you should be able to get to that easily, even with the higher capital cost of the actual vehicle itself. So I, I expect that an Apple autonomous car delivering experience will be cheaper than getting in a double-decker hop-on, hop-off bus, which pretty much makes it a mm -hmm. pretty obvious discussion. However, if you're a specialist uh, driver, then you might still be more expensive, and you will still have a business because you'll be delivering your personalized service, whereas these autonomous vehicles will probably be taking the market of the volume sightseeing bus companies. That's, that's the target. We're not necessarily going to get to the same level of human ability to be nice and meet people and welcoming people and just give that local voice. I think you're still going to have that as a business because that's what you're about. Autonomous vehicles is going to really hit the uh, classic volume sightseeing sector much more. Okay, there's a last question at the back then, and we'll stop for this one. All right, we're, okay, we're good. Okay. Oh, oh, you oh. answered. You answered, okay, there we go. <laughs> Hi, John Catterson, Aero Luggage. Um, been a really interesting talk so far. So, if, we're, if, if autonomous vehicles are going to be introduced by 2030, what happens to emergency service vehicles? Will they also be autonomous? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I, I'm not. That's not really my speciality, but I. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not putting you on the spot. I, I'm going to answer that question slightly differently, okay? Which is, um, one of the things that I'm building up with Autora is I've worked out that there are three emergencies that are not quite the same as the emergencies that you're talking about. But I'm talking about three emergencies. And the first is, and these, uh, if you've got kids, and if you've got kids under five, this is, these are definitely emergencies. One is, I need a toilet, yeah? Uh, which is the number one question that every tour guide gets asked is, where's the toilet? Um, Secondly, uh, is I want some food, and the uh, thirdly is find me a pharmacy or find me A and E or find me some you know GP or something, something medical. But um, so one of the things that we're building actually is a is a this again sounds a bit weird, but when you think of it like this, it does make sense. Is I've got these three body function buttons on a, in an autonomous car. You've got toilet, food, medical. Um, so we're building a database of toilets that can be parked outside using autonomous vehicles. I'll tell you, that's just, you know, in five years' time, you think, God, Alex, that was really clever. And I'll go, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's clever. Well, no. yeah. So anyone else, here, anyone who wants to provide some toilet database, uh, to toilet data, uh, <laughs> I would love to do it, because I am trying to aggregate uh, the positions of all the tourist locations' toilets, which is actually a good, good thing to be aggregating, I think. Um, but um, so those, so what I'm dealing with minor emergencies in our vehicles. They're not the emergencies that you're referring to. But thank you for the question. I'm sorry I don't know the answer of your real question. <laughs> and, I, and 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 I'll, as, I'll start off a rival and, company then. And as you said, the, the presentation was going well until now. I think it's just gone downhill, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I could kind of chip in on that question, uh, the military cowboy are investing billions in autonomous vehicles. Where the military goes, the emergency services normally finish. So global military have vehicles all over the place that are autonomous and they've already got them and they're going to have much better. Yeah. You're suddenly going to see fire engines following that, ambulances following that, because the technology has been made cheaper because it's been paid for by the military. The army, yeah. Interesting. Well, I found that absolutely fascinating. Hope you guys found that as well. So can you all give a massive thank you for that? <laughs>